Okay. Now I'm just plugged in so I don't lose power on the iPad. Hi, welcome to YouTube Model Builders, and a special edition this evening. I've got Jerry Cornwell with me, and for those of you that don't know Jerry, he is a really great model railroader. He used to be the owner of Mac, uh, can you think, Mount Albert Lumber Company. Some of you may have seen the special that I did uh, with Barry Silverthorne um, at his shop. But what his real endeavor has, has always been is lighting. He is an expert at lighting. He does theaters, um, schools, you name it. He, he's just an expert at lighting. And we want to talk about LED and I saw his LEDs. I saw his layout, which is lit with LEDs. So we thought it would be an ideal opportunity to talk to a professional lighting engineer and talk about some of the things that you can and maybe should do if you're thinking about lighting your railroad with something other than the fluorescence like I have. Um, I've made some mistakes with LEDs, so I'm going to let Jerry set me straight and maybe the rest of you as well. So stay tuned. We're going to have Jerry in just a minute. All righty. I want to say go to YouTubeMallBuilders.com. There you can uh, check the uh, show schedules because we're in the summer season. So we got a few uh, less shows because people on vacation out doing stuff and just need a break. So be sure to check YouTubeMileBuilders.com. Tuesday, Wednesday shows are at 8 o'clock Central, 9 o'clock Eastern Time. And the Thursday show is at 9 o'clock Central, 10 o'clock Eastern Time. There are some rescheduling being done, like tonight. Uh, we're having a fine scale during the uh, Thursday show. Next week, we're going to be doing the same thing. The uh, Joe Desmond into the locomotive shop. Uh, he was unable to uh, do his show on his normal Wednesday night, so he will be doing his show on Thursday of next week. That will also be at 8 o'clock Central, 9 o'clock Eastern time, so stay tuned for that. Uh, two shows we got next week, June the 19th, that's uh, who's Big Bill talking to. He's going to be talking with uh, Ron Perry, and then... Uh, Whoa, June 21 uh, will be the uh, Joe Desmond into the locomotive shop. I'm going to take the night off is what I'm doing since I <laughs> scheduled the uh, locomotive shop on my my night for my show. So I'm actually going to take the night off next week. And uh, I guess now we're going to turn it back over to uh, Miles. It's all yours. All right. Well, I, I hope everybody can see Andy or see Jerry. Jerry, welcome to the show. Yeah. Thanks, Miles. And uh, absolutely fantastic medium that we can have people scattered all over the country. Um, Jerry's up in Canada. And of course, I'm in Kansas City. And uh, Andy's in Tennessee, Kentucky, Kentucky. And Johnny down in Atlanta. So absolutely fantastic medium that we can get all these people together. But this show is about Jerry. So, Jerry, tell us about layout lighting. <laughs> Thanks, Miles, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's uh, kind of fun to be able to uh, apply my uh, professional skills to my hobby, which is, uh, uh, I guess, all of us do a little bit of that one way or another. But uh, uh, I know a guy who was an electrician, and the underside of his lab was the best part. The wiring is absolutely spectacular. Um, so I've been working on a new layout uh, in ON30. Uh, started off in Acre and then went to ON3, and now recently, uh, in the last few years, moved, moved to ON30 because I kind of like funky little climaxes and shades and stuff like that. So since I was starting from scratch with a new home and a new layout, I thought it would be a good idea to do something a little unusual with lighting. So we're going to start off uh, tonight, um, we're going to review some of that process, but I'm going to start off with a little bit of the theory of lighting and color, largely because there's so much misinformation out there 
Um, people have heard different things, but they don't really understand what's going on with both the color, how, how color is reproduced, how color is viewed by humans. So we're going to take a little, look, a little look at that. Then we're going to take a look at some hardware. I even have props. Ooh. And um, we'll also look at lighting design uh, from a designer's perspective, how I would approach uh, the typical design problems you have in a layout. So I'm going to show you a drawing showing sort of typical arrangement of the hardware. So, And then at the end, we're going to take a look at the different color effects that you can achieve. Um, start off with white light and then talk about some color. And I've got some slides showing some color uh, effects I've taken on my own layout. So here we go. Um, I understand uh, I, I've worked with this group before, but I understand you take questions, and uh, we're, I'm happy to handle those as we go. So what is it? So it's radiant energy that enables us to see. And when we say us, we're talking about humans. We're talking about human vision. Um, a lot of the other critters on the planet don't see the way we do. So dogs have no color vision, for example. Insects see in the far infrared. Um, and in the ultraviolet range, and we can't see in, in those, in those uh, parts of the spectrum. And the spectrum basically looks like this. It's, ex it's actually all the energy uh, that's represented on the pl in the universe. And there's this little tiny portion, as you can see, uh, I'll put my pointer over that, you see this little tiny portion here, and if you see that whole section in color, which is basically the spectrum from blue to red, that's essentially what we see. Humans see that portion it's from it's around about 370 up to 760 nanometers. Those of you who want to pass the test that we'll be doing later on. <laughs> so one of the first uh, principles to understand about light and color is, is, is the idea of whiteness and the idea of how color appears in objects. Um, when we're talking about artificially lit environments, and we're almost always talking about an artificially lit space when we're talking about a model railroad, um, the color of the object is not going to be visible unless that color is present in the light source. Um, that may be intuitive at first, but the difficulty here is that most of our light sources, our artificial light sources, are deficient in one or more parts of the spectrum. And this is why we have so much difficulty, I think, in getting true color, what's called color rendering, in, uh, in objects on our railroads. Um, as a person with 30 plus years experience lighting in the museum industry and art, fine art lighting, you can imagine how important that is in museum uh, displays and in fine art displays uh, to get the color absolutely right. And that's why, um, and, and this, a theory that is the order the color has to be in the light source uh, is really important to get your mind around um, and as, a, as you'll see in a moment um, quite a lot of common light sources are deficient in, in parts of the spectrum so each light source that we use emits a specific spectrum and there's no such thing as a perfect artificial light source no matter how the marketing department might try to fool you by telling you it's like daylight or it's natural is a word that shows up in a lot of marketing, um, that's actually uh, also referred to as snake oil. Um, it's, uh, it's to get you to buy a product. It, it's not true because there is no artificial light source that represents daylight. Um, what makes this even more difficult is that each object has a specific spectral response. So every object that we have on our railroads, for example, will have a specific response to the spectrum from the light source. So if we're lighting a hillside where we've got a lot of trees, for example, we're obviously going to have a lot of greens, maybe some yellows, then a light source that's really strong at the red end of the spectrum is not going to be doing us a lot of good. We're not going to be seeing a lot of that green color. Um, if we model a railroad that uses specific colors, um, that uh, that's part of their corporate identity. Um, the uh, Union Pacific or uh, Southern Pacific might spring to mind. Then we want to pick a light source that's going to be complementary to those colors. And perception problems really occur when those spectra differ. So if you're looking at a at a, um, a model on your layout that's supposed to be boxcar red and it doesn't appear boxcar red to you, it looks kind of muddy, it looks kind of brownish, it's kind of gray. You might think, oh, it's got bad paint. Um, it's quite possible that the problem is not the paint, it's the problem is the light source. 
So how a lighting designer looks at this is through a spectral power distribution diagram. This will also be on the test. Um, <laughs> and SPDs are, are, are actually not that easy to come by. You, you can get them from the manufacturers. Sometimes they're posted on websites. Uh, uh, but as a designer, I can get them from, from the manufacturers and ask for SPDs, and they will give us an SPD diagram. And that makes it possible for an engineer to determine the spectrum of the light source. And for artificial light sources, it depends primarily on the gas mix in the bulb, in the case of uh, fluorescent lamps, for example, or the phosphor coating, which applies with fluorescent lamps and with LED lamps. So this same problem that we're talking about applies to LED. LEDs use phosphors to change the spectral output of the light to make it either warmer or cooler in appearance. So let's look at what one of these things look like. And this one is noontime sunlight. Um, this always surprises people, or often surprises people, because they expect that the uh, daylight uh, or sunlight uh, spectrum would be completely even right across the spectrum, and of course it isn't. Uh, it's typical of nature. <laughs> uh, nothing is what you expect. Um, and as you can see, we've got um, we've got particular uh, weakness of the blue end here. Uh, this is relative power. Uh, you'll see that there's pretty much flat across the top. And you'll see that it sort of drops off a little bit towards the red end as well, which is maybe not intuitive what you'd think. But notice it says noontime sunlight, right? Um, you, you would imagine that if we did the same test at the end of the day when we have a sunset, we would have very, very little down towards this end of the spectrum, but we'd have a whole lot coming up at this end of the spectrum with the red. So notice it says noontime because daylight does not actually have a, an engineering definition. Daylight is, uh, it varies according to the time of day, how cloudy is it, uh, what altitude are you at? Uh, so there's lots of variances that happen in daylight. Incandescent lights, as you can imagine, have this spectrum that is extremely leaning towards one end, and that's because an incandescent light bulb is better light, a heat source than it is a light source. Um, all of the energy, this is only this only represents about 10% of the relative power in, in, a, in an incandescent lamp. Most of it's off here, outside the visible spectrum. Infrared heat is what, uh, is, is what the, uh, an incandescent light bulb is actually producing more of than actual visible light. Uh, it's a kind of product that if you were to introduce it to the market today, people would be rolling on the floors laughing. They would say, are you nuts? What just happened? I don't know. We lost him. Lost Andy, too. Yeah. Let me do a refresh. I got Cherry back. Here comes Andy. I don't know what happened. Jerry, you're going to have to restart your PowerPoint. Oh, right no, from the no, beginning? Don't start all over. No, just restart it and go back to the page you were at. Okay, so back one page? Uh, yeah, I dropped everybody for some reason or another. That okay? Uh, you'll have to restart your screen share. Oh, really? Yeah. Okie dokie. All right, so stop sharing. And then start up again. Yeah, I don't know why up here dropped everything, but it did. Hey, Miles, I can see you. Hello. <laughs> I like we Miles. Need we need those flashcards that says technical difficulties. Stand by. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I want that one. <coughs> All right, everybody out there on the show. Oh, <laughs> they can't hear me. How are we looking, Jerry? Yeah, we uh, uh, need to get rid of the sidebar. Uh, I don't have a sidebar. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I do. He'll be good once, once he kicks it back to full screen. He'll be good. Yeah. Okay, we good. Uh, not yet. I'm still seeing the sidebar. Are you still seeing the power primary PowerPoint window? Yeah. yeah. Is that my fault? I don't see Jerry. Yeah. 
I'm not seeing it. I've just I've just got my uh, my. Let's see, it's PowerPoint, but let's see here. Yeah, just kick your PowerPoint into full screen, and you should be good to go. Yeah, that's what I have. No, oh, I don't see. Uh, we don't see it at full screen. All I see is PowerPoint. The just the desktop. Uh, the PowerPoint editor is what I see currently. How's that? <laughs> no. no, drop your screen share and restart that, please. Okay, let's try it again. Hi, right, for those out there watching the live show, as y'all can hear, we're having a few techno difficulties and we're working through it. I don't know why, but a peer had to drop everything on me. People have forgotten what it was like for live TV. That used to be the only TV out there. Now it's all pre recorded and everything goes along without a hitch. Yeah. Everybody forgets that live TV, it's live TV. Whatever happens, happens. <coughs> Well, there's some great YouTube videos of live TVs where a guy drop, loses his watch and whatever oh, he's going off. That yeah. didn't work. <laughs> yeah, well. That's like super that stereo. <laughs> okay, application window. You probably won't see the application window until you have PowerPoint presentation in pro er, presenter mode. Okay. <laughs> How are we doing? Okay. That's not good. All right, let's try again. I'll point over here. Select PowerPoint. Share. And there's now we got the PowerPoint editor. Okay. So once you put that full screen, you should be good in theory. That's what happened last time. Yeah. Yeah, I think normally with the Application presenter. I don't. It's maybe a little trickier to get the full screen view. It. I don't really have to present the entire desktop. So I'm I'm back to the PowerPoint slide view. And right now we can see the PowerPoint editor. He won't. It won't change slides when he changes slides. It won't. You're seeing this. You're seeing the screen, yeah. right? You there see. you are. Oh yeah, this will this will change the slide. Yeah, yeah, that works. Okay, so th is that okay? That's where you were. We were talking about you were talking about the noontime lighting and how it, it's different than morning and night. Yeah, is that better? We got that far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't mess That's with that. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Where were we? Okay, we're talking about Let's daylight. Get him. I don't see. I don't see Jerry. I see you. Or hear you. Yeah, I can. I can I'm... see and hear Miles, and I can see and hear Andy. And uh, Johnny's hiding behind the screen. <laughs> the man behind That's the right. screen. Okay, so noontime sunlight. Let's go back to where we were. So we are talking about the. Um, I apologize for the technical difficulties. So something happened. We got uh, we got kicked off the internet. It must be uh, something weird going on. Welcome back, Miles. Thank you. And um, <laughs> so we we're talking about noontime sunlight. And one of the things that surprises about people is the relative energy. And uh, one of the things that surprises people is this isn't a straight line. So you'll see that the noontime sunlight is deficient in blue end and a little bit low on the red end and pretty much flat in the middle. Somewhat un unintuitive. Uh, of course, this is noontime sunlight. If you were looking at sunset, as you can imagine, it would probably be a bit higher at the red end and much lower down at this end. So it's, uh, it's not, a, it's not a, uh, a straight line. Uh, here's our incandescent lamp. And uh, as you can imagine, it's, it's extremely deficient to the blue end of the spectrum. It's basically a combustion light source. We're basically consuming the tungsten filament inside of a, a glass container. 
a hot wire in a bottle is a good name, way to think of it. And uh, as you can see, this goes up like this. Well, this only represents about 10% of the energy that's in an incandescent system. The rest of this goes way up in the sky here. That's all infrared, which is your, your incandescent weakness, and that is uh, energy efficiency. So it's really pretty, really pretty awful. And uh, we're losing all our energy up here in the un unvisible or non-visible part of the spectrum. Now, here's a completely different animal. And this is what a, a typical fluorescent lamp looks like. And yeah, go ahead. All right, let's see. We got a question here from uh, Nathan. Does it affect blocking half of the light? Where you block half the light source? What kind of effect would that have? Uh, effects on what? Energy or color? Uh, or? What you're illuminating, your color balance, stuff like that. It depends what you're blocking it with. So if you're using like a silver or a 90% or 98% white reflector material, it's probably not going to affect the spectrum much, so the color won't change. Obviously, you will reduce the light level. Uh, the illuminance, as we call it, um, will be lower if you're blocking the light, but um, if you're using a filter, for example, or any kind of diffusion material, you're probably going to change the color a little bit. If you're using anything that's tinted or colored, uh, obviously it'll change the color a lot. And we got another question from Sparky. Uh, so a light bulb called daylight, is that to represent what time of day? <laughs> <laughs> so the light bulb called daylight um, was called daylight by the marketing department. It wasn't called daylight by the engineering department. Um, they could have called it ethyl uh, or you know myrtle or something like that, but they thought they'd sell more light bulbs if they called it daylight. It's a fluorescent lamp, a typical fluorescent a daylight lamp is a 6500 Kelvin lamp, which is extremely blue. Uh, I would not recommend its use for model in any interior, frankly, but certainly not for model railroad use because it's for most people it's most it, it's too blue. If you have boxcar red cars under that lamp, you will not see boxcar red. You're going to see kind of a muddy brown because there's no red content in that lamp. I hope that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, moving on, Andy. Good. So here we have a 4100K fluorescent lamp. Now, this is where we start getting into the arcane world of um, uh, non-continuous um, spectra. So all the arc source lamps um, are non-continuous. So you see what's happens. The difference between this and this is that we, have, we now have a very, very spiky uh, spectral power distribution. And the Location of these spikes is determined by two things. That would be the gas mix that's in the bulb. So these uh, fluorescent lamps have gas mix inside them, but most primarily by the phosphor that's on the inside of the bulb. So if you look at a fluorescent bulb when it's off, it appears white. And that white that you're seeing is actually the phosphor coating that's on the inside of the glass tube. And the, the composition of that phosphor is going to determine where these spikes are on the spectral power distribution. So we can make a fluorescent lamp pretty much any color, which we couldn't do with incandescent lamps. Incandescent lamps have one color. Um, if we want to make them a different color, we have to put a color filter in front of them. But fluorescent lamps, we can make them electronically or chemically rather, uh, by changing the phosphor, we can make that appearance quite different. So this particular one's a 4100K, which 4100K means it's very cool. And as you can imagine, a lamp like this is going to have a whole lot of energy at the blue end of the spectrum. And as you can see, that's what we're seeing here. You know, big spike here, pretty good spike in the green, up into the yellow. But as you can imagine with this lamp, boy, your reds aren't going to be very well rendered because there's virtually no red content at all. So if you've got a shirt on the color of, uh, of um, miles there, or you've got a, uh, a boxcar, red boxcar, or you've got red in your uh, Southern Pacific, for example, in your color scheme, this would not be a good lamp to use because you're not going to see those colors accurately. Then we get to LEDs, and then things get a lot more complicated. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, there's three, three images here. Uh, the one on the top right, uh, this one here is for a um, system that uses three colors of LED, red, blue, and green. Um, and what it does is it combines the three colors to give you white light. So you, you combine the three, three primaries, RGB system, and we get white light. This is not commonly used in white lighting for LEDs because obviously it's much more expensive. You have to have for each module, you now have to have uh, three uh, elements uh, and you have to be able to control them individually. So it's, it's a much more costly way of doing it. But if you're going to do color changing, then this is what you need to do. This is what's used in theater, uh, in, in cinematography. Um, when people want to change colors, uh, they have to go this way. Um, what's more uh, likely to be used in a, in a wild railroad environment is a white light uh, LED. And the thing that's interesting about this is that there's no such thing. So a white light LED is actually a blue light LED that's been fooled to produce white light by using phosphor on the inside of the lens. So all white light LEDs currently on the market have this very, very um, consistent uh, pattern. They call it the spike and the hump. So you get a spike and a hump, and a spike and a hump. You can see these two are the same. Now these two lamps were very, very different appearance. This is a cool white lamp, about 5,600 Kelvin, with a very blue white appearance. And this is a warm white lamp, which has got a very yellow warm, sort of a red warm appearance. So they look quite different. But as you can see, both of them have this big spike. Now the reason they have this big spike here is that white light LEDs are actually blue light LEDs, and then we're using a whole pile of phosphor to change the color. Now in this particular lamp, they don't have to use very much phosphor because they're trying to produce a cool white, cool white light. So the blue is actually helping a bit here. I'll explain the dotted line in a moment. This one here is a warm white. Now what we've done here is we piled a whole bunch of phosphor on this, on the lens of this, and that phosphor is changing the color of the light to make us think that it's warmer, okay? It appears warmer to us, which is all that matters. The curved line, the dotted line here is what's called V lambda. That's where your eye is most sensitive. So as you can see, this cool white lamp has a real disadvantage here because almost all the energy is outside of the range where your eye is effective, okay? You get that? This is where your eye sees the warm part of the spectrum right in here. That's where you really see well. And look at this big spike here, it's outside of that range. So there's a bulge here. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. It doesn't mean it won't appear to you. But as you can see, it suffers a big price in terms of the efficiency because you don't really see in a portion where it's producing energy. This, la this LED is gonna be much more effective as um, for vision simply because it's got a big bulge and it almost exactly matches where your eye is most sensitive. And for those of you who are scientific and might notice that these two curves are not identical, it's only because the x-axis on this graphs are a little bit different. So they've one of the white has been compressed, so that's why it looks off. Okay. Moving on. So how do we measure these things? Um, if you're going to go to a store and buy a light bulb or a light source, you're going to need to know how do I determine this? And as a specifier, I need to be able to specify it. So there's two metrics, basically, correlated color temperature and the color rendering index. And we're going to talk about both of those because it's good to have an understanding of those. This is the information that's printed on the box. And uh, so you need to know what those numbers mean. So the color temperature of a lamp is expressed in degrees Kelvin. So it's 3,000 degrees Kelvin, 4,100 degrees Kelvin, 5,000 degrees Kelvin. And Kelvin is just another temperature scale it's used in science, largely, um, same as uh, very similar to Celsius or Fahrenheit. Um, it represents the whiteness of the light. So the higher the value, the whiter the appearance of the light. So a typical, uh, this, this graph here shows some uh, correlated color temperature scales. And if you look down at the bottom here, you'll see a candle right down here at the bottom. So that's a candle that's about a little bit less than somewhere between uh, 1100 or 1500 and 2000 Kelvin. Very, very, very yellow warm appearance. You all know what a candle light looks like. Well, now you know what that 1500 to 1800 Kelvin appearance looks like. A 40 watt incandescent lamp is around uh, 2500 Kelvin. 
okay? A tungsten halogen lamp is around 3,000 Kelvin. So you're all familiar with that. A cool white fluorescent lamp is up around 4,100 Kelvin. A clear metal halide lamp, which they're still using in some of the big box stores, they're up around 4,500 Kelvin. So you get that sort of more harsh, sort of bluer look to the light. And then if you go way up high here, you'll see uh, a clear mercury lamp. Now, if you look way up at the top on the right, an interesting little comment here, north light blue sky. Now, this is where we get into a little bit of difficulty, and that is that it, there is no light source that's on the market today that represents, that will reproduce that color of light. Because that true, that north light blue sky that you see outdoors, if you're facing north, and it's a, uh, it's a sunlit day and there's no clouds, that quality, that color of light is extremely high color temperature. But there's something that goes with that, and that is it's also an extremely high light level. And we'll talk about that relationship a little bit later on. Now we come to the hard one. The hard one is the color rendering index. Oh, wait a second. Let me back up a second. So why would you choose a different color? So you're going to choose a color, and we'll talk about this again later. I'll show you some pictures. But you're going to, uh, in general terms, you're going to choose the color of the light, the color temperature of the light, based on what you're trying to model. So if you're modeling the fall in New England, you're probably going to want to tend towards warmer colors. What your primary color is going to be. Your primary colors of your scenery are going to be greens, oranges, and reds. It's going to be really at the warm end of the spectrum. You're not going to get a whole lot of blue in that, right? If you're modeling um, Colorado, if you're doing uh, modeling narrow gauge, for example, like I do, uh, in Colorado, it is blue. They call it big sky country. Uh, you're high altitude. Um, the air tends to be thinner. And the color tends to be much towards the blue end of the spectrum. So people mod modeling Colorado might mo use a 4,000 Kelvin lamp. If you're modeling New England, you might use a 3,000 Kelvin lamp or 3,500 Kelvin lamp. The only way you can tell what works for you is to try one, see what you like. Now, here, come, here comes the tough one. This is color rendering index. And color rendering index is really a uh, problematic metric. Um, it, it describes how well an object's colors are rendered by a light source. And the colors below are examined under a reference light source and under the test source, the one that we're testing. And the less color shift between the two, the higher the CRI value. Now, this is a somewhat simplistic explanation of what's going on, but generally that's, that's what's happening. So it says a typical cool white T12 fluorescent lamp will have a color rendering index of around 60. All the newer fluorescent lamps over the last few years, T5 and T8 fluorescent lamps are 85 or better. Most of the LED product that's out there, sort of around the 80 mark. Generally, it means that the higher the number, in general terms, the color's a little bit better. Um, I won't specify anything less than 85, simply because the color is so important in the, in the lit environment, especially for model making. Now, the problem with this metric is that it's seriously flawed. Um, it's been around since uh, basically the, I guess the, the experimentation started in the 40s. Um, the one that we're using today was, uh, uh, was finalized in 1978. So it's, it's, it's pretty far behind the technology that we have. And it hasn't caught up with the new technologies. So there's a new... Um, the other issue with CRI is that it's very, very poor at judging, at accurately determining or measuring LED performance. So it's going to be replaced by a new color rendering system uh, based on IES and ATM30, which is a, a technical memorandum about how to, how to measure color. Uh, I actually attended a webinar about this today. So color samples increased to 99. We got way more color samples. And the values are derived by a weighted average. We now have two values to look at, which would be fidelity, in other words, how accurate is it, and gamma, which is a measure of the saturation of the colors, which we didn't have before. The result is a much more accurate determination of color performance of artificial light sources, and it could take 10 years or more for this to be standard practice. Now, how is this of any use to you? Um, the important thing to know is that color rendering index is not kind to LEDs. So the only way you're really going to know if it's working for you 
is buy one. Don't buy 30 of them. Buy one and make sure you like it. So TM30, um, the old system used eight color system samples. TM30 uses 99. CRI uses only, determines only a fidelity metric. Um, TM30 gives us fidelity, gamma, and, it, and it's graphical. So it gives us a graphical representation of, of how far out it is. Uh, much easier to determine what it's looking at rather than just a number. And it's much more detailed. Um, in CRI, the reference element that we're comparing has got a step function in the middle of it where we change to a different it's like going from miles per hour to kilometers an hour, halfway up the speedometer. It's absolutely nuts. Um, the new one is continuous. And the, the CRI actually has no lower limit. So you can actually get sources that have negative color rendering indices, which how do you get your mind around that, right? It's got minus 21. Right? That's great. Um, so TM30 has a, zero, a one, 1 to 100 scale. So it's much more uh, easy to understand. It is coming into the market eventually. Um, a lot of LED sources have jumped, manufacturers have jumped on this, so they're providing the information. Now, some other important considerations. So we've talked a little bit about light. We've talked a little bit about uh, um, artificial light and the color of artificial light. And now let's talk about the human side of the equation. So first of all, we don't see light. We only see reflected light. Uh, there's In the room you're sitting in right now, there's light in the air, there's light traveling from a light fixture or a light source onto the surfaces that you're looking at. If you put your hand in front of that light, your hand is illuminated. You take your hand away, you can't see the light. It's traveling through the air, but you don't see it. So you don't actually see light. You only see reflected light reflected from objects. Our perception of brightness is determined by two things, not just the quantity of the light, but also the color and reflectivity of the object. And if you're modeling the steam era, guess what? You got a lot of black objects, <laughs> right? Which are a real challenge to light because the more light you throw at them, the more they absorb. Glare is critical for perception, especially as we get older. And I take a wild guess that a good percentage of our audience tonight is over 50. So uh, anybody care for 80%, 90%? So, um, as we get older, uh, there's natural thickness of the thickening of the lens of the eye, and it's, uh, it increases our sensitivity to glare. So any light source that's in our in, in our line of sight is going to be a problem. So when we're lighting our objects on a railroad, we want to make sure there isn't a glare source. So if I've got a, li a layout that's got a peninsula, for example, that comes out into the room, I want to make sure that the lights that are lighting the opposite side of the layout aren't also shining in my eyes when I'm standing on the opposite side. Contrast, visibility increases with contrast. So that is the more difference there is between the object I'm looking at and the background, the easier it is to see. Black on white print would be a case in point. Uh, black, black lettering on the screen, as you can see here, uh, obviously much easier to see. If you look at these little triangles, which are sort of a gray color, you can see they're harder to see than the black letters. And that's simply contrast. So our eye reacts to stronger contrast. The lighting designers get really fixated on luminance ratios, and that's comparative brightness. That is, how bright is this compared to that? So the uh, 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 lighting designer I work with uh, once described the, design, the work of the lighting designer as painting with light, which is a really interesting way of thinking about it. Now let's talk a little bit about efficiency or the term we like to use is efficacy. And the reason we use that term is because you can charge $25 more per hour when you do that. So it sounds like you know what you're talking about. Uh, efficacy is used to um, separate the uh, efficiency of the light source from the light fixture because the fixture also imposes its own uh, constraints on the system. So the light fixture may have 80% efficiency, but our light source may have 70% efficiency. So we've got to put those two things together and get a number we can work with. Um, so efficacy is basically lamp performance, and it's measured in the lamp lumens output, that is how much light comes out per watt of energy. So it's called lumens per watt. Think of it like miles per gallon. Um, now, this is really problematic with LED systems, of course, because the value often used in advertising is the lumens per watt at the chip level, which is essentially meaningless. 
because the chip is not what you're using. Uh, the chip is internal to the LED lamp. If I have an LED lamp like this one, you can see that. It's a small LED. This is an LED replacement for an MR16 lamp with the two pins here. Uh, inside this, there are four chips, and each chip is about the size of the head of a pin. The efficiency of that chip is really quite amazing. But as you can see, there's a whole lot of stuff in front of that. First of all, there's a whole bunch of phosphor. There you go. Is that working? Yeah. You might be able to see a little bit of yellow on the inside there. That's actually the phosphor on the inside of the chip. They've had to pile a lot of phosphor on these to get the color where we want because this is a 3,000 Kelvin lamp, so it's warm. It means it's a ton of phosphor. And there's a whole bunch of plastic. There's a lens on the front. Okay. So the efficiency of this final system is a lot less than the efficiency at the chip level. So some less than completely honest uh, uh, companies are advertising, you know, 180 lumens per watt. Well, that's maybe at the chip level, sitting in a pool of liquid nitrogen in the lab somewhere. But when you actually get the light fixture, you probably find it's around 100 lumens per watt, something between 90 and 100, which is good. It's very good. Uh, but it's not what they're telling me. So here's a comparison between our different light, typical light sources. Um, and these numbers really vary a lot um, depending on whose product you're looking at. I'm sure somebody will call up and say, well, I've got one that does this. And you said, that's fine. Um, the, uh, but generally you'll see the, the big uh, bad boy here in terms of efficiency down here. This is incandescent lumens per watt. It's typically around 10 to 12. Um, so it's, it's essentially uh, uh, awful. But one thing you'll notice about incandescent is because it's a combustion source, it has spectacular color rendering properties. It's lousy at the blue end of the spectrum, but it has a really, really high CRI value. Uh, part of this is because of the way CRI is measured, um, which, as I said before, is somewhat faulty. But as you probably know, if you use a halogen light source, you'll find the colors are very, very pleasing. We still use halogen in some applications, particularly, for example, in the uh, museum business on uh, ceramics, on white ceramics, where we need to have a really, really clear um, perception of white, and, and it works very, very well. Um, LED, a, a little bit less uh, than, than CRI typically, is uh, somewhere up in the 80s and 90s. It's very good. Um, and as you can see, energy is obviously way better. Uh, LED and linear fluorescent energy is very similar. Uh, compact fluorescent is pretty much gone. Um, it's it's uh, pretty poor energy performance and, and somewhat mediocre color. Now, a little bit of harsh reality here. Um, and I'm not, I'm not opposed to LEDs. I've, uh, I've probably specified more LEDs than you've had hot meals. Um, I've, I've used a lot of LED technology in a lot of projects. Uh, I did one of the very first museum uh, LED installations in North America, for example, in Manhattan. And, um, but people are making decisions to purchase LEDs based on economics, and the economics are often not there, particularly with what we're talking about, because we're not 10-hour-a-day operation. Um, so LEDs are sold based on energy saving, and many of us make decisions based on the economics. We say, well, you know, I know it's expensive, but it's going to save me money. So here's some economic reality. So we take a four-foot LED fixture. It costs 80 bucks, and you replace that, and you use it to replace a four-foot fluorescent fixture, which costs $31 with the lamps. And these are based on actual price prices at Home Depot in the U.S. yesterday. The fixtures from the same manufacturer with about the same lumens. So in other words, approximately the same light output. The LED fixture saves 18 watts, which is considerable. Now, if you were running, you know, 10 hours a day, 365 days a year, that would be a saving. But you're not. If you're running in a, in a model railroad, you'll be very, very unlikely that you'd even meet 1,000 hours a year. But let's say you've got 1,000 hours a year. There's 8,760 hours in a year. So if you ran 24-7, you, that would be what you have. So a thousand hours a year is probably about what most model railroads are somewhere between 500 and a thousand. So you're saving 18 watts. And let's say you're paying a blended rate of around 10 cents a kilowatt hour. That's going to give you a dollar 80 per year saving. Yep. <laughs> it take, it'll take 27 years to pay the difference between the LED fixture and the fluorescent fixture. So that doesn't mean you don't buy it or use it because it has other properties that you're interested in, 
relatively low heat, for example. It's not no heat, but it's lower heat. But you won't live long to pay for it, enough to pay for it. And the technology won't last long enough. It'll probably get, you'll probably get 12 years out of it. So make an informed decision. Don't run out and buy something convincing yourself that you're going to save a whole pot of money. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, some examples of um, lighting. Now, these photographs were taken with a digital camera, um, but they were taken with a color balance done. So uh, the colors are... Um, the, the, we started the middle one, so they're probably going to be a little bit extreme on the warm end of the blue end, particularly on the blue end of these slides, but you'll see what I mean. Um, so we're going to start with a warm one. So this is a 3000 Kelvin. Uh, this one's fluorescent, but it could be LED, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's a high CRI, this one's 85. And the same appearance would apply to fluorescent or LED at the same color temperature. So this is a, uh, a one of the... Um, Malawi scale models uh, structures. This was the third kit that we did. This was the uh, um, Malawi Brewery, uh, which was a, uh, a, a homage, if you will, to the Campbell Brett's Brewery. Some of you might remember that. It's not identical to that, but very similar type of building. And as you can see, 3000 Kelvin, high CRI around 85. And this is warm white appearance. Now we're gonna go to a cool white ambient light. It's 4,100 Kelvin, so much, much higher uh, color temperature. Once again, the same CRI, and with the same appearance would also apply to fluorescent or LED at the same temperature. Now, as you can see, this is way, way bluer um, than, the, than the previous one. Now, you'll notice that some of the things that, if we go back and forth between these two, I'm going to flip back to the warm one for a second. Okay. Now, you'll notice in this one that... This all this stone here looks like it's all tan colors. It's all sandy type of colors, right? And if you were modeling an adobe building or a building in the southwest, that might be perfectly appropriate. But if we look at this picture, all of a sudden we've got grays and blues in that in that coloration. And this may be much more appropriate for a middle of the country or even a little bit in the north. Um, somewhere where there's limestone, for example, uh, which would, might be more appropriate. The other thing I want you to do is I'm going to go back again. Take a look at the backdrop. I, was, I didn't change the color of the backdrop. Backdrop is backdrop. And now all of a sudden our sky is much bluer. That's because we're using a lamp that's got a lot more blue content. And because it's got more blue content, the blue color is going to show. If you remember, one of our second or third slide was if the color isn't in the light source, it's not going to appear in the thing that you're lighting. Now we're going to go for a medium or neutral ambient light. This is 3,500 Kelvin. So this is sort of the in-between spot. 3,000 is warm, 4,000 is cool, 3,500 is, is fairly neutral. Same information applies. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, so high CRI, 85 or better. And the same appearance applies to fluorescent or LEDs, the same color temperature. Now this is a neutral color temperature and this is, this is the one I prefer. And the reason I prefer it is that it works with almost all parts of the spectrum. It's not too blue and it's not too yellow. And you seem to get a much more accurate representation of a range of colors. All of this is a compromise. There's no such thing as a perfect uh, color rendering lamp for every application. Um, but I think this is one that works uh, quite well for the widest range of colors. Um, this would be a particularly good color um, lamp source to use if you were lighting uh, a railroad that has a variety of colors in its equipment. If you're doing a railroad that's just got everything's boxcar red, which would be fairly boring, um, then you know, you're going to lean towards a warmer color. But if you're using, if you've got a railroad that has a, has a variety of colors, and a lot of railroads use green, particularly on passenger equipment, sometimes blue, uh, so you, you can get uh, billboard boxcars, obviously, that have a lot of color to them. So, uh, so a neutral color lamp like this might be, might be more appropriate. All three of these have just been using an, a diffuse light source. In other words, notice that it says ambient light at the top. So these are all ambient 
light sources. And the reason they're ambient light sources is that they're not um, focused, they're not accenting, they're just providing a wash of light. They use a, a lens or a, 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 some kind of diffusion to uh, uh, make the light more diffuse and less direct. Now you'll notice that we have just a little bit of shadowing underneath these eaves. We'll see a little bit of shadowing underneath here. There's basically, there's no shadow from this umbrella or from this, <laughs> that's not an umbrella, that's a ladder. A um, little bit of shadowing under here is quite good, but the rest of it's pretty washy. You know, it's a little bit, a little bit bland. So let's take a look and see what happened if we add some ambient, some accent light. So now what we've done is we've taken uh, our same picture that we had just before, that's that one. And what we've done with this is we've added a 20 watt halogen, um, which is 3100 Kelvin. And uh, this would be the same effect if we used a 3000 or 3100 Kelvin LED uh, light source. That uh, would probably be around eight watts or six watts. Uh, same appearance applies to the fluorescent or LEDs, the same color temperature, doesn't matter which, which light source we're using. Um, the accent light provides modeling and shadows to an otherwise diffuse appearance, and it becomes more like a sunny day. So let's take a look at that. Now what's happening is we've got a lot of 3D happening in the model that we didn't have before. First of all, we've got very, very clear shadows underneath our eaves. We even have a shadow on the side of the water tank from the ladder. There's even this great shadow here on this roof from this ladder here, going over here. Uh, we've got great shadows under this porch and under the bottom of here. So everything becomes more defined. Now, this is a trick that's used in museum lighting all the time. It's to make objects pop. You really want them to, to come out. And you'll notice this, the stonework becomes a lot more clear. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and forth between the two of those. So here's with the accent light, and there's without the accent light. With the accent light, without the accent light. So um, uh, Johnny and I were having a conversation, or oh, maybe it was Andy, we were having, uh, having this conversation about this uh, earlier tonight. And... Um, to me, it's, it, it makes the difference. It makes all the difference. Um, lighting a railroad, a model railroad, with all with diffuse light is great when you're working on it uh, because it gives you nice, there's no very few shadows. It's really easy to work on. But if you really want your models to stand out and you need to add some accent light, you don't put it everywhere, but when you've got a, a structure like this, you're going to get a lot more attention and comments on it if it's lit like this as compared to this. Hey, Jerry, can we ask a couple questions while you're at this point and have the pictures up in front of you, too? Go right ahead. Um, yeah, we, there's a couple questions in the chat that'd be good to, to get in now. So we've got the picture in front of us. So, um, and, and absolutely, I, I've said that before. We were talking about that earlier. Me and Ralph have talked about that several times in the past. About so and Me and, and, and uh, Miles, too, a few times about how, like, Lex Parker and a lot of these modelers are using spot bulbs yeah. to create a shadow effect. And the lack of shadow is, is is uh, lost on a lot of model railroads while, yeah. while some model railroaders like Charles Kirk, for example, somewhat famously paints his shadow into right. a scenery right. uh, to create the effect. But as to, some of the guys in the chat were asking the true color of this, the true color of this building, uh, my response was what has, my, I said, my instinct would be it has no color. If there's no light, you can't see it. So, right. but I, I didn't know how you would answer the definition of what the quote unquote true color would be. I suppose it's what you're looking for, right? Yeah, but the color, like I mentioned before, color color is quite subjective. So because it refers to humans and, and perception doesn't occur in the eye, perception occurs in the brain. The eye just collects the data and it sends it to the brain down the optic nerve. The optic nerve goes, oh yeah, that's green. Um, but your perception of green and my perception of green are different. Um, to add confusion to this, first of all, you've got age, which means color perception is reduced. All visual perception is reduced with age. Um, at the age of 60, you need three times as much light as a person at the age of 20 to get the same visual perception. So we need higher light levels. And the other issue is that 10% of the male population, which I think probably most of the people tuned in tonight are men. And uh, sorry, guys, but 10% of the male population is functionally colorblind in one part of the spectrum or another. So what looks right to you may look completely cuckoo to me. 
And what looks great to me may look wacky to you. So it has to be what you perceive and what you see as the, as the correct thing. So the, the only thing I can do when somebody says to me, what's the real color of this? And say, well, take it outside. That's probably going to be the closest you're going to see to the real color. But there's a problem with that too. And that is that under natural light outside with the intensity of light that's outside, now things that look perfectly correct under artificial light at much lower light levels are going to look ridiculous under sunlight. So um, light is a model too. I've got a slide coming up on that in a moment. But um, yeah, the, 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 the real color is what uh, basically is what the observer sees. Sure. John, John Lawrence and I always used to say that what you really need to do on your railroad is take your building and in your paint booth or in your railroad, do your painting. Because how it looks in the railroad is what counts. Exactly. Not what it looks like outside, yeah. not what it looks like in the family room. Yeah, yeah. You need it under the layout lighting, the actual environment into which that model is going to be placed. Yeah, don't paint outside. I mean, paint outside if you're just spraying something with rattle can and you don't want to die from the fumes. But, <laughs> yeah. but pick your colors under the same lighting. I've got the same lights on my, the same color temperature lights Absolutely. on my workbench. So they're different. So there'll be some variability there. Yeah, you get fewer surprises that way. That's right. Yeah, the last last item while while we're answering a couple of questions and have a break so we can carry on for a bit, it was that they were mentioned in one of your previous slides. You were talking about uh, failure rates or life expectancies. They were asking about how life expectancies somewhat sarcastically about who sat there with the stopwatch. But um, in in computer technology, I'm an IT professional. In computer technology, the MTBF, their mean time before failure, mean right. time between failures, is to, is a statistical speculation. It, it has no real world meaningful right. metric. But we can use it. And if you have 10,000 computers, it might actually mean something to you. But if you're buying a single computer in the LED world, would you could, do you think that's about the same kind of relationship where it really not the that problem, mean? The problem in the LED world is that you're, you're, you're not talking about a single element. Um, and, and a lot of people that are quoting extremely long lamp lights for LEDs are talking about the chip and the chip, the LED chips will last an extremely long time. That's not what's failing. What's failing right is the thing that's behind this, right? Here's your LEDs at the front here. There's four of them here. What's back in here is the driver that makes it work, and it's the drivers that fail. Um, so the mean time between failures for drivers is, is relatively speaking short compared to the LEDs. So you'll notice that what happens is it's very, very rare that you'll have an LED fix a lamp like this, a light source like this that's got four LEDs in it where one of them goes out. That's very rare. The whole thing goes out. That's because the drivers failed. And we've seen this in every, every section of the LED industry. Street lights, uh, fluorescent replacements, uh, um, traffic signal lights, all kinds of them where the individual LEDs don't fail. The whole thing fails, and it's because the driver has failed. So the, um, there's quite a bit of electronics packed into here. And as you can imagine, it's exposed to quite quite a bit of heat. But I'll show you the difference between these two. If you look at the back of this, you'll see it's got little slots at the back. You can really just see those little air slots at the back. You're trying to get the heat out of the back of the LED because with LEDs, the light output is inversely proportional to the heat at the chip. So you've got to get the heat away from it. Now, take a look at this. This is a, this is a PAR-16. It's the same wattage. Actually, I think it's less wattage than this other one. This is, uh, excuse me for a moment, I think this is seven watts. Yeah. And uh, if you look at the back of this, now this, this is all aluminum. This isn't plastic. Okay. And you'll see also, you can see through. You see how you can see through this? So it's a heat sink. The whole reason behind all that is to get air through this unit and out the back of it to get the air past the lamp to keep it alive longer. So heat uh, management, uh, what's called thermal management in light fixtures for LEDs is critical. Uh, and this is what we found when we were doing large scale street lighting studies is that companies came up with very nice designs with very good performance of fixtures and they were failing in six months. And it was because of really bad heat management uh, in the fixtures. So especially in a Toronto winter <laughs> becomes quite critical because guess what? When they're on, the snow melts. <laughs> so it's a, it's a challenge. 
It, it is somewhat encouraging, though, that, you know, when, when I decided years ago what kind of light I was going to use, I decided by temperature because uh, at that time I was using film and, and photography was kind of a, like it is for a, model, a lot of model rares, a secondary hobby. <clears throat> it's encouraging that the Kelvin temperature really has not changed. In other words, whether or not it's whatever kind of bulb that you were just showing up with all the different types and the charts there, you're going by color temperature in what the color rendition, the brain's perception of the color rendition happens to be. So whether or not I use LEDs that are 3200 or I use uh, fluorescents that are 3200, I'm going to get the same kind of color. Exactly. Perception. Yeah. That's why color temperature is a better indicator than color rendering index because color temperature is actually accurate. <laughs> color temperature is very easily measurable. Uh, CRI is, uh, yeah, it's like I say, it's a faulty metric. So, um, so the CRI, I think the, the important thing with the color rendering is that it works for you, is that it is that you find it what it want. It, with the color temperature, I think that's going to be much more driven by the palette that you're using, what kind of colors you're using on your railroad. And, uh, and and what your scenery, time of year, things like that. It, it was amazing to me many, many years ago. I had a friend that works with John Allen, who was always considered to be the wizard of Monterey right. and a very fine photographer. But one of the tricks that he did was that in his lighting of his layout, he had different temperatures of light. And he would allow people to make photographs of the layout simply because he knew they weren't, this was in the film days, he knew they were not going to get good pictures. Right. <laughs> when he went to take the pictures for the magazines and the covers and everything that he used to do, he turned off the room lights and brought in his photographic lights. So he had control mm -hmm. yeah. over that Calvin temperature to match his film. Yeah. Uh, just a Dang. little known thing about, I mean, he made his living by making photographs, so he obviously wanted to protect his proprietary. Exactly. Yeah, I, I tell people that, that it, don't don't light your railroad for photography. Light your railroad to light your railroad to make it look great. And then if you need to for photography, bring in some extra lighting. But um, I always think it's it, it's it's a bad strategy. Um, first of all, you're going to need a whole lot of intensity um, yeah. to get reasonable um, uh, reasonable photographs. And it's probably going to cause a lot of fading, and it's probably more likely than you typically need. Uh, most most model railroads are underlit. It's, it's 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 pretty unusual to see a railroad that's overlit that you do occasionally. Well, that's you can only see some of mine, but I have seven light pockets, I believe. Yeah, seven light pockets across about a twenty-five foot space, and each light pocket is sixteen feet long. Right. It's got two, two eight-foot fixtures in every pocket, and then diffused. And I did that on purpose because I'm seventy years old, and you were hundred percent right. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I need this kind of light level or I don't even see what I'm making. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I've really upped the amount of light that's in this room just so when people come in, they can actually see what's going on. Exactly. Yeah, it would seem to be like it'd be impossible to lighting for a camera sensor in the digital world anyway, or a, and for an eye would be like trying to, to match the lighting for two people's different perspectives to where two different people, because it's basically the same thing. A camera's going to read differently than your eye, just like another human's would be. It'd be really hard to find something to, that would be pleasing for every single lighting equation or for sure. multiple people, just like for you and or your camera. That's the most logical. I had thought about trying to light for, uh, for photography, but that makes a lot more sense to me. Yeah. Well, but, and Andy, it goes to the camera as well. Each camera has a different sensitivity. Sure. So yeah, they're very measurable. It's, it's just like everybody's eyes are different. Yep. That's every, every version of the iPhone has a better camera. <laughs> that's where when I went to the NAB show here last month, and the the secret career field of film or video nowadays and, and digital the digital age is the same as it used to be. 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and that's the colorist. Right. You ask yourself, well, what's a colorist? Well, you don't even stop to think about it when you go to a movie, but the guy who made that movie pop, who made it attractive to your eyes and to your brain is the colorist. Yeah. Because he takes what the cinematographer has done, what the camera's done, yeah. what the lighting director's done, and he changes it. Yeah. <laughs> He's Absolutely. in charge of the color. He can take his, his uh, lux scales which is a whole nother ball game but he can take all those luck scales and change that film totally to what he wants it to look like he's changing exactly. colors 
to make them pleasing. Well, well, we'll see some of that in a few minutes. I've got some slides that are, have color, and you'll see what happens to a structure and to a model and a figure when you, when you change the color, yeah. Yeah, it's a fascinating career. <clears throat> Jerry, you, you mentioned earlier about the cost between LED and fluorescent. Uh -huh. And my argument is fluorescent now is not where LED is now. Fluorescent's been out for a long time, and the longer it is has been out, the cheaper they've they've become. Because, and I think the same thing's going to happen to your LEDs, which will bring it more in line with what you have with your fluorescence. Absolutely, yeah. I I, I don't I don't tell people not to use LEDs, but um, for that reason, I just want to make sure they're making an informed decision. We get a lot of uh, corporate clients who think that they're going to put LEDs in their building and they're going to save tens of thousands of dollars. And it, even with a, you know, relatively long hours of use, it's still sometimes a bit of a, a bit of a, uh, a problem. We did a, um, a machine shop for a guy, not a huge shop, but, um, uh, and he wanted to use LED. And then we did the costing for him and he said, eh, I think maybe I'll stick with the fluorescent for now until they come down a bit of price because it just didn't make sense economically for him to do it. Uh, he was only going to save a, uh, a low percentage. The, 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 the top end, um, high efficiency fluorescent systems are still a good uh, white light light source uh, for large areas. And uh, if you're, you know, I just don't want people to make, you know, uninformed decisions. Now, in my argument for or against is not a, is not an economic argument. My, my, I'm much more in favor of LED, not at all because of economics in any way, but because of control. The amount of control yeah. you have with LED, the ability to tune like an RGB light source or RGBW light source, especially the ability to tune and manipulate those, let alone doing scheduling and day to night lighting effects or dust to dawn lighting effects. The control you get where fluorescent is dimmable. But with a lot of complexity uh, and, and cost, and to deal with the you know high uh, high wattage uh, uh, potentiometers, that that's or RAS stats, whatever that that gets to be a problem. But LED, that it's a trivial thing to manipulate LED. Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't use the word trivial, but I would say it's it's a lot more doable um, at certainly at lower cost. I've, I've got a um, you see, I started putting my lighting in for my layout seven years ago. And the first thing I did was all the ambient lighting, which of course seven years ago there really wasn't any white LED fluorescent replacement, and there is today. But um, so I used fluorescent, but I'm using dimming fluorescent. So of course it was expensive, um, and you can't get right down to zero. You can get really close, but you can't get right down to zero. So um, and it takes a pretty good dimmer to do it. Now it's not a three hundred dollar dimmer, but you, you still need it. You can't do it with a five dollar you know, rheostat type dimmer that you get from Home Depot. So it's um, yeah, it is. It's certainly way more costly. Andy, I've got about sixteen more slides. So do we want to move along? Because I see it's uh, what is it? absolutely your time. Yes, sir. Sounds good. Okay. So where are we? Let's take a look at a couple of typical cross-sectional drawings. Um, the drawing on the right here shows a typical uh, shelf mount uh, layout. Um, we even have some little trees here, and we've got some track, rail, and ties there. Isn't that exciting? And, uh, and what I'm showing is I'm showing a valence. Um, this would be just a typical setup, and it wouldn't matter what you were using as a light source. You could be using LED. You could be using fluorescent, whatever. Um, and also some, um, some accent lights. So our lights are concealed up here behind this uh, valence. And the reason for the valence is that, um, is glare. We basically want to eliminate the glare and we want to make sure that the light goes where we want it. There's no point lighting the middle of our room out here. Um, we're going to get enough spill light from this that we're going to be, see, be able to see plenty well out here for walking around in the room. You're not going to bump into your buddy. But what we want people to look at is we want them to look at the railroad. We want them to really see the detail and want to see the, the color and all those good things. So what we do is we put a valence here, and that means we no longer have any problem with glare. Now, we can use uh, a regular fluorescent fixture here, or we can use a side mount fixture, or we can use an LED under counter type fixture, which tend to be very low profile. Um, and that's going to determine the size of our valence. Notice it says to suit here. And, and this uh, valence height is going to be determined by a lot of factors. How, what's this dimension here? How tall is the ceiling? How high is the ceiling? 
Uh, I have pretty low ceilings in my basement, so I can't have this. I'm six feet, six two, so I can't have this thing sticking down too far and me banging my head on it and cursing all the time. So that's no good. So uh, I have a very minimal balance. So I used a side mount fixture, so I reduced the height. And then what I did for uh, accent light was basically um, I wanted something inexpensive because I wanted lots of them. So I've got 24 or something like that uh, accent lights on my layout. And I wanted to use something really inexpensive. So I found these on, uh, from electrical distributor. You can get them from Amazon. Basically, it's, a, it's an outdoor rated um, lamp holder. Just looks like that. You usually see these with a, with a, a par lamp stuck into them uh, in front of a garage or something like that. Quite often, you see people using them with a sensor for, for uh, security lighting. Um, these typically sell for somewhere around two or three dollars. And you can, it's got a half inch uh, nipple on it, and you can screw this into a, uh, a regular uh, outlet junction box, which I've shown here in my drawing. I've shown my little junction box here, and I've got this thing hanging off the bottom of it. It's adjustable in, in two planes, so you can rotate it this way, and you can also adjust it this way, so you can point it anything you want to. And then into that goes either incandescent or, in my case, an LED power lamp. It's like that. So that looks like that. Now, it's not the prettiest thing on the planet, but it doesn't matter because it's behind the valence. So um, and it works perfectly well. And you don't need a fancy looking fixture in a situation like that because once again, the valence is hiding the aesthetic of the thing. Uh, these dimensions are fairly typical. So whatever this is, um, you can move this valence a fair distance back and forth this way. Three, or, It says plus or minus six inches. Maybe three or four would be better, but somewhere in there, um, it's better to have it a little bit away, further away from the wall would be your ideal situation. The reason for that largely is you don't want something at the but right at the front of the layout, if you have track right at the front edge of the layout, you don't want the locomotives or the cars to be in silhouette. You want them to be front lit. So you do want a little bit of light right in here. So the further this comes back, a couple of inches, three inches, it's really going to help with that. Um, you don't want to come way out here because the next thing that's going to happen, you're going to be looking at your own shadow. Okay, so now let's, let's have some fun. So we, we talked about white light, and we talked about ways of achieving white light and what the difference is if you use some accent light as opposed to just a piece of ambient light. So let's see you add some color. So um, for my layout, I, did a, I, did a, uh, I decided early on that I wanted to have what's called a diurnal effect, which is basically a day-night effect. Um, and I can, so I, can, I want to be able to tune the color according to what time of day is. So I've got a sequence coming up here showing the dawn, day, sunset, and night. And this requires a separate system of LED color changing strip and a controller. And yes, it can be expensive. Uh, this is the strip I'm using. Uh, this is uh, fairly readily available. You can get them through Amazon. This is by a company called Osram, O-S-R-A-M. And this, this product is called Mosaic. Um, these are actually not LEDs. These are resistors, but there's the LEDs right there. You probably won't be able to see a very good detail. Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually uh, three, three chips uh, in one unit, one light engine, as it's called. And um, this, is, uh, this system is very, very low power consumption um, and uh, pretty good light output. Um, it's, it's not going to replace your fluorescence. It, it doesn't have enough light output to do that. Uh, it's not going to replace your ambient light, I should say. Um, it, uh, it just gives you some light, but when it comes to the color, really the only way to, to give you that, that look. Um, part, of the, part of the cost of this is the controller. Now, this system here comes with a neat little controller, which I carefully put a piece of paper on top of. That's what that looks like. It has the word Sylvania on the bottom here because this product was originally uh, marketed by the Sylvania company in the U.S., but it's an Osram product. Osram actually owns Sylvania or did. Um, and uh, they have this three little controller, which enables you to control the colors, but it doesn't allow you to program it. You can change the colors with a button, but you can't actually program it. And I want to program. So I'm going to put in a programmer and that's going to cost something like, something like six or $700 to do that. But that, can, that programmer will make an automatic diurnal effect. It'll change automatically over a time period. I can set that time period and it'll, it'll change uh, day-night uh, when I want it to. 
Um, so let's take a look. Um, here's our dawn look. Now this is just a little scene that I set up. Um, this is one of uh, Jerry Ricard's uh, backdrops. Uh, this is a um, uh, track slide scenery uh, backdrop. Uh, this is a wharf scene on my layout. This is not complete. There's no track on this foreground here. That we'll be tracking that eventually, but you can see track in the back there. Um, I stuck a, a, a lit building here because I wanted something with light on it so you can see the effect of that at night in the night scene. Uh, this is a, a, a chair here from our Right here, this is a chair from our upcoming kit that we're doing. Uh, watch our website for that at, uh, on Fast Track's website. You'll see that, that kit coming up. Um, that's all laser cut. And Buddy here and his, uh, and his dog are, are watching the, uh, the Shea heading out for work for the, for the day. And uh, he's come out of the shanty here and uh, is looking. The dawn's just coming. You'll see a little bit of a pinky glow to the sky here. You'll see some pink reflected here, for example. And this is lit with the uh, with a little a little bit of white light, and um, the uh, for the ambient light source, uh, which is fluorescent. A little bit of accent light, not very much, mostly off. Uh, you see a little bit of shadowing under here, a little bit of shadowing under the dog and the guy here, and a little bit of shadow from the locomotive. But um, we're getting the color, the pinky sort of color. We're getting that from the uh, from the LEDs. Now let's go to the day look. And now what's happened is that the, obviously the light's out because they turned the light off and they're going to need it now. And now what we've got is we've got the full fluorescent uh, ambient light on system on, and we've got the full um, accent light on. You'll see the, you see the shadows here again. See the shadow here. We see the shadow of the dog's tail there. Kind of cool. And, um, and the LEDs are all in white. Now we've got our sunset effect. And uh, the transition between the two is really cool, but I didn't have time to video that. So it's, uh, I don't really have the tools for doing that. I'm making a good job of it. But um, uh, this, is, this is really, people really like this look because it's, uh, it's cool. And of course, the, uh, the incandescent light, these are actually LEDs, but they're, um, they're about a 3,000 Kelvin. So you can see the really warm look. There's actually a little lantern sitting on top of a barrel inside the shed, so it's shining on the door there. And uh, as you can see, we've got shadows now are coming from this light. You can see the shadow of the man and the dog in front? These are important details because in photographs, those really show up. So it's really important, I think, when you're setting up scenes like this to try to make sure that those shadows are realistic and believable, and that makes for much better, uh, better photographs and better models. You can also see the red glow, which is reflected off of the, even off the wood surfaces. And the last one we have here is the night effect. Now this looks awesome with the, uh, with the lighting uh, of the structures and also of course with the lighting of the, uh, of the, the equipment, the locomotive lights uh, look great and the passenger cars throw those patterns from the windows on the, on the, the scenery. Um, so once again, you can see that the uh, obviously the incandescent color light is really giving us some great shadows and some great uh, uh, reflectivity of the wood in front of this, uh, this structure here. But you can also see that it's, there's no question in anybody's mind, the sure is night. And all that's on here is just the blue LEDs. There's nothing else on. Okay. So let's talk about some lighting design principles. We've just got a few slides left, so we'll move along pretty quickly through these. And uh, we already talked about this earlier this evening, and that is that light is a model too. So, and, and that gets forgotten, I think. Um, if you look at outdoor color, the, uh, the noonday sun outdoors is typically 10,000 lux, which is 1,000 foot candles, and it's 6,000 Kelvin or higher. And the illuminance inside on a model railroad to minimize fading is going to be 300 to 500 lux, maybe a bit more for us of senior citizens, 30 to 50 foot candles, and 3,000 to 4,000 Kelvin color temperature. So as you can see, there's a very, very dramatic difference between these values, particularly the illuminance levels, right? If you were to light to the same light levels as you have outside, first of all, all of your painting would all be wrong. All your colors, would, none of your colors would work. If you want to see the truth of that, just take a card or a structure that you've done that you're really pleased with, take it outside and stick it in the sun and see what it looks like. You'll be pretty, pretty unhappy because the intensity of the light 
is now going to wash out a great deal of that color. So, um, so the color intensity if some, for something outside has to be much higher than inside. So I'm always fascinated by modelers who go out and find the prototype. You know, they'll chip a little piece of wood off a timber off an old trestle and say, oh, I'm going to cover that exactly like that. Well, no, it's probably not a good idea to do that because it looks fine outside at 10,000 bucks. If you bring it inside at 100 lux, it's not going to look real good. So um, the, uh, uh, this has a big impact on our, on our perception. And the other thing is time of day. Um, so early and late in the day, warmer color temperature, early and late, midday is cooler color temperature. This is going to have an impact on the appearance. Time of year is going to have an impact. So summer and fall would be warmer color temperatures. Winter and spring would be cooler color temperatures. <clears throat> Geographic location. You mentioned that earlier. Colorado would be cooler color temperature. California would be warmer color temperature. Color rendering. Always aim for the highest CRI you can afford. Those, uh, these lamps, you can't buy these at Home Depot. So this is a, uh, this is an Osram Ultra LED. <laughs> and uh, this is a lamp that was developed for um, uh, art lighting and for high-end retail. And that means you can't buy them at Home Depot. So you're going to have to go through an electrical distributor or somewhere like that to find these lamps. But the 90 CRI. So the color rendering is significantly higher. They're also significantly more expensive. Get with your paper. Uh, in terms of shadows, use some point sources as we, as we uh, our accent lights as we, as we showed you earlier to create shadows. Uh, fluorescent or diffuse lighting or ambient lighting only is too flat. Uh, photography, we mentioned before, light your layout for building and operating, light separately for photography. It's less of an issue with digital, but it's still, if you want to get those great pictures, you really need to light separately for photography. Well, people have concern about fading, and uh, any amount of light will cause fading. Um, and the UV component is the biggest problem. And, of course, LED has no UV content. So um, there's, fading is a function of the quantity of light, whether it's foot candles or lux. The time of exposure, the lux, lux hours, how many, how many lux times the number of hours. Um, and the light source type, how much UV, and the sensitivity of the objects. The thing I found in my modeling uh, is that the most sensitive things that we deal with typically um, is ground foam. Uh, it seems to have the most what's called fugitive dyes, the most affected by light. Um, most of the paints that we use on our models uh, seem to be pretty consistent. I know some people have said that some of the commercial stains uh, have some issue over time, especially under fluorescent light, uh, good fading. So the quantity of light, time of exposure, light source type, and the sensitivity of objects. There are filters you can get for putting on fluorescent lights, for example, but unless you've got a UV meter, you don't know if it's working. So I think it's probably not worth it. Keep the light levels reasonable. Turn them off when you're not needed. That's, that's, a, that's the most common sense solution. That's what we do in the museum industry. We keep the light levels reasonable and we turn them off. Usually use sensors, things like that. Anything that's really sensitive, use a sensor in the case. When somebody walks up to it, the light comes on. When they leave, it turns off. And that way, the least amount of damage. Um, fluorescent lights cause the most fading. Newer style T8, T5 lamps are the best. Uh, stay away from old style T12 lamps, especially the eight foot types, really bad for fading, high UV output. And there's no UV with LED sources. It doesn't mean there's no fading, it just means there's no UV content. So there is fading, but there's less of it. So UV filters I mentioned, really no way of knowing if it's working unless you have a meter. So an interesting aspect of lighting design, there's no right or wrong way. Um, there are a number of choices and they all offer different compromises and different effects depending on what you're after. So keep in mind that human vision is dependent on perception. Your perception is individual to you and 10% of the male population is functionally colorblind. You can be tested for that, by the way. Any decent optrician um, <coughs> can, uh, can test your vision for color. There's two tests. If you pass the first test, they don't do the second one. If you flunk the first one, they'll give you the second one. <laughs> 
as a lighting designer, it's kind of important for me to know if my color vision is accurate. So here's the design approach I've used successfully on a number of private and public displays. Diffuse ambient light using low energy and low heat sources such as fluorescent and LED. Focus spotlights to provide shadows and better 3D modeling using incandescent or LED. Use accent lights selectively <laughs> and cut the whole layout. You don't want to put them every two feet uh, because now nothing stands out. Everything's the same again. So really what you want to do is pick those things just like they do in the museum. They say, okay, this object is really, really important because, you know, George Washington touched that. So that's great. We want that one. We want people to go, wow, look at that. Um, and so you might have a little bit of in between towns. You might have a little bit of scenery with a rock face and a stream or either a nice trestle and put a light, little special light on that. And then you have a little bit of two feet of scenery with nothing terribly exciting happening. And then you may have a really spectacular structure or station or something like that. You want to have an accent light on that. You want people to, you want to focus people's attention. Um, so use them selectively. Use the museum lighting principle. Use light to direct the viewer to the critical points such as rock outcrop structures. It is better not to light your entire layout to a uniform illuminance. Always model under the same lights on the layout, especially when painting and weathering. And how much is enough? So most modelers don't own luminance meters. There are some apps for smartphones that work reasonably well, probably close enough. Um, luminance will be a function of how well you see. Some will require more light than others. And a recommendation, I would say a minimum would be 50 foot candles or 500 lux. And my layout, layout varies from 70 to 100 foot candles because I'm 70. So I need to almost, not quite caught up to you yet. Um, so the, uh, I find with about 70 foot candles, I can see really well. And, um, and, and still, if I'm going to be doing some really detail work on the layout, um, I'll have a portable light, uh, which makes it even easier to see. Your vision is so important. And I'm done. I'd like to thank my wife for the photography and Roger Malinowski who built the Mount Elbert. That's spectacular. I, I got a couple other things for you, one of which I have a pretty decent question around. The other one is just more of a, uh, uh, I'd like to get your sentiments on. So we've talked about lighting several times uh, and, and heard several other people talk about the same thing. It throw distance. Uh, has been a, a concern for a lot of people interested in LED lighting. And, and people have argued in favor of using uh, a compact fluorescent or something else because of large throw distance. Like if your layout's at 48 inches and you've got a 10-foot ceiling, that's six-foot distance. Uh, Mike Neverall had a really good video some years ago or a couple years ago. Uh, he has a really nice YouTube channel. Uh, Colorado Front Range Railroad, and he, he did a really in-depth 30, 40-minute kind of uh, deep dive on lighting, not with all the, um, not with the spectrum analysis, et cetera, that you've provided. This, this is a great information, but his argument was that LED lighting didn't have the throw distance, but if you've got the lumens and you've got the color temperature as you want it, should throw distance really uh, vary between light source material? The, the only thing that's going to affect really throw distance or the only thing that's going to be affected by it is the beam of the lamp. So if you think about, um, I don't have a building to draw on here, unfortunately, but if, if you were to have, uh, if you think about, I'm going to make a little sketch here without being able to make a draw anything. You think a triangle like this, okay? So I'm making a little triangle here, right? So if you uh, think about uh, an object, the light fixture up here and, a, and an object down here, if I increase that distance, then that beam gets larger and larger the further away I get from it, and the light level goes down and down and down. Um, uh, the light actually is reduced by the square of the distance, so it's, uh, it's inversely proportional to the distance by the square. So it's a really huge difference as you get further away. Um, uh, for most model railroads, you're talking about a throw distance of anywhere from you know four feet to six feet, something like that. It's usually... Anything outside of that is pretty unusual. On a shelf layout, obviously, you're going to be really, really short. Um, and on a, a layout in a, in a big room like, uh, like um, uh, Tom Miller's place out in out Colorado, you're going to, he's got a 22-foot ceiling, right? So, you know, there are going to be variances. So in a, if you've got a really, really big room, you're going to need lamps that are very, very narrow beam, right? Because otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to get down, if you use a wide beam, when you get down there, you have hardly any light because you've taken the same amount of light, you've spread it over a much larger distance, right? 
as you go up, you have to go narrower um, for the accent lights. The uh, any diffuse light source like a fluorescent or or a t t LED replacement for a fluorescent is going to be disadvantaged by the distance that you get away. If anything, LEDs might be a little bit better for that because, of course, an LED ambient light is still a whole bunch of points of light, and uh, they're going to have about a 60 degree dispersion, so uh, it should work reasonably well. Uh, we've lit spaces with um, with uh, 16 foot ceilings with LEDs in a, in a commercial environment, and it looks fine. Um, so I, I, you know, I wouldn't think it's a huge thing. I, I think it's more of a challenge when you've got a short space than when when you've got a big one, because when you've got a short space. You can't find a light that's wide enough to affect to work for you. You really want something like a 60 degree beam. That's really hard to find. <coughs> the ones I'm using here are 35. So, and that works reasonably well for uh, uh, a nice spot of light, maybe about two feet in diameter from a throw of about four feet. That makes sense. And that kind of relates to the second question I had about, about and this is what I couldn't formulate into a question real well about diffusion. I'm using a diffuser. Um, yep. I mean, I know that has some impact on the, or maybe I should ask that as the question is exactly what impact does a diffuser have on, on light? It has to dilute or reduce the effect Absolutely. of the light because yeah. it spreads it. Absolutely. Yeah. And the only way you can find that out is by measuring it because every diffuser is different. So yeah. um, the diffusion I'm using, uh, the standard diffusion is called a, a called a, a K12 or a pattern 12 diffuser. That's a standard fluorescent lamp diffuser. It's got a whole bunch of little triangles on it. Uh, look like little pyramids upside down. Yep, see and, those lines. Um, that's a standard fluorescent diffuser. And it does cut the light by about, I think I'm guessing here, about 15% or something like that. Um, I'm using, uh, I don't particularly like the look of that. And because I'm using LEDs, what that does is actually designed to take the light and diffuse it right out like that. I don't want that because I'm using accent lights. And I have to use a diffuser in mine because my ceiling's so long. So I'm using a um, what's called a, a cracked ice, which is an acrylic uh, sheet material, um, and it's got a. It's not completely random, but it looks like a random pattern on it. And uh, its diffusion is about. Uh, I measured it. And I, I can't remember right now, but I think it's about nine or ten percent. It does. It does reduce the light. Thank you. Um, uh, Miles is holding up a sheet of cracked ice right there. Uh, there's, oh, another, yeah. there's another use for cracked ice that a lot of people haven't thought of. It makes fantastic water. I've seen it used it years and years and years ago. I see that as used as a water source. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you're doing a small pond or something like that, I mean, you couldn't do a river with it really because it, it, you know, it wants to be flat and it's really hard. You're not going to bend it very well. But uh, if you're doing a pond, it, it's, it's spectacular. Yeah, I've seen that done. That, that kind of answers the question I had, diffusion. It, and it kind of applies to the same thing. People were talking about lensing uh, yeah. earlier in the chat. And I just, I have a lot of question as to, with all the choices we have in lights out there, taking a light that, that that's out there, then lensing it to a different aperture, for lack of a better way to say that, but, but lensing that to a different shape or a different pattern of light effect, Seems right. like you're, it seems like the harder way to solve that with all the source of lights that we could, that you could choose. To, if you're purchasing lights instead of using what you already have, it seems to be more, more applicable to, or more, the better decision to buy the lights that have the correct, um, correct beam. Yeah. 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 It makes more sense that lens has a lot of casualty and, and, and complexity and you're just, you're, you're putting a lot of variables into the equation that seems complicated to me for, for unnecessary reasons with all the choices we have in this stuff. It depends what you're like. If you, if you... I'm sorry, I didn't get that, Johnny. There we go. Cool. <coughs> I'm even uglier bigger than I am small. So, uh, <laughs> thanks, uh, Johnny. I feel much better now. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah, it depends what the situation is. Um, it, one of the issues I talked about briefly earlier was the problem of a peninsula layout or an island layout where you've got something in the middle and you're going to walk around it. And the problem with that is glare. And if you've got uh, overhead uh, lights shining down onto the layout, if you're on the other side, Chances are, if you're using accent lights, you're going to be looking at them, which means you're going to have glare. You don't want that. Um, 
the human eye is attracted to the brightest thing in the field of vision automatically. There's nothing you can do about that. It's just like breathing. You don't have to think about it. Your brain just does that. So that means you're not going to be looking at what I want you to look at, for starters. And then the other thing is when you're exposed to glare, your pupil closes down. When your pupil closes down, you now don't have the perception that you had before. And especially for us older types, for that pupil to open up again, it's going to take time. It's not going to happen in an instant. It's not going to happen in a few seconds. It's going to happen over a number of minutes. Um, the older we get, the worse that gets. And for anybody over 65, it can take seven minutes for your eye to get back to normal dilation from closing down because of the glare source. So protecting the eye from glare is really important. I have a peninsula on my layout. And, uh, and also I have this low ceiling issue to deal with. So that's one of the things that is a requirement for me is that I have some kind of baffle system or uh, an acrylic sheet to, uh, to get rid of the glare. So question, in the picture you can see a couple of my light pockets. Okay. The, the entire layout is lit totally even because in my cyclorama roll here, I can't afford balance. If I put balance in, I get a shadow line across and it destroys the illusion of that continuous sure. background. I understand. So yeah. putting, putting highlights or putting in accent lights becomes, well, in my case, I, I'm assuming it's almost impossible, but how am I going to get accent lights when what I have is cracked ice and all of these to try and diffuse and make that diffuse light more even around all my rolls. Okay, so um, Miles, the uh, if if you remember the pictures I showed with the uh, with the shadows on the um, on the on the on the warehouse uh, uh, dock with the locomotive, yes, the shadow that's shooting through cracked ice. Okay, I'm shooting a seven watt LED through cracked ice, and those, that's the shadows. So I could so, put accent lights up in here. Yep, and just aim them. Yeah. And you, you want to use a fairly narrow lamp, like maybe about a 25 degree, because that's going to give you, uh, it's still going to diffuse, because the, the cracked ice will diffuse that wider, but it's still yeah. going to give you a pretty clear shadow. Yeah. Huh, okay. Yeah. Good. I'll send you the bill tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> I don't you know, know, the mail the between the Canada and here are pretty bad. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Consultants say my clock is ticking. Yeah. One, one more thing, then, that's that's secondary to lighting, since it's that, but kind of ties to this is is control. So I've been torn by by using Arduino's and writing my own code to to use Arduino's for RGB lighting control and tying those to my JMRI fast clock, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. right. I, that's possible. There, I don't have a. Uh, okay. I don't have a problem doing that. About that Andy, because that's a real that's a real big uh, that's a real big challenge right now. That that is, I won't say it's impossible. It's doable. But the real issue with dimming uh, LEDs that it's it's actually fraught with difficulty. And the reason it's fraught with difficulty is there is no industry standard for drivers. So the two basic approaches that most companies are taking. Um, but electrically, it gets very messy. And because there are no industry standards, each company is sort of doing their own thing. Um, Lutron, who is one of the major manufacturers of dimming systems for both residential and commercial applications, used to publish a list of uh, LED lamps like these. Uh, there it is. <laughs> Where is that? Where is that? Oh, right there. Um, <coughs> like these. They would list this part number and they'll say, yes, we can, you can dim that with this product that we make, this dimmer that we make. They've actually stopped doing that because it got so messy uh, because everybody, and in fact, the same manufacturer will actually have different drivers. And then to add to that, the LED industry is, so, is changing so quickly that they'll change the product line while it's in production. So they'll start off with one driver, and then a year later, they'll change the driver because they've got something that's better. But yeah. then they'll find out that it's no longer compatible with your dimmers. So yeah. it's really, really messy right now. So I, what I tell people, and I, they, I went to a, a lighting industry event um, about a month or two ago, and uh, the guy was doing a talk on problems or issues with LED controls. There's maybe 45, 50 lighting nerds in the room, Okay. And he said, is there anybody here who hasn't had a problem dimming LEDs? 
Not one hand went up. Not one hand. Everybody has had issues doing LEDs. And what happens is, the other problem is that legally, you can sell an LED product in the United States that says dimmable on it. Okay? And what that means is, you can hook it up to a dimmer and it doesn't explode. <laughs> okay. right? I mean, yes. it sounds like a joke, but that's, what, that's the truth. Um, when, when a lighting designer says dimmable, what he normally means is that you can dim it on a scale like this, just like an incandescent, like it dims from zero right up to full, right? Yep. Most of these won't do that. What they'll do is they'll go, oh, oh, and you'll never get to full. Yeah, they stay. If you dim yeah, the hand, they'll go, oh, like that, right? So 100% dimming is, from what I've seen, almost unachievable with an LED. You can get pretty close. Some are better than others. Um, you have to know uh, the product that you're using in terms of the, the LED product you're using, but you also have to know the dimmer. And the only way you're going to know is to do a mock-up. And even that's dangerous because we've seen mock-ups where we hook up five and they work fine. You hook up 200 and they don't work. Sure. So, you know, it's, it's really a messy scene right now. And it's, uh, it's because we're dealing with an immature technology that's on this climb, this massive, you know, it's leveled off a bit, but, you know, this, this technology change has been so crazy that uh, nobody's been able to keep up. And, and, and the standards haven't kept up either. That's why we're having this conversation about changing the, uh, the color rendering standard, because it doesn't work for LEDs. Well, it's a new technology, and it's, it's still an immature technology, because, you know, there's some things that you can't do. So and does the LED same LED guidelines LED. apply to that as it does to strip lighting? Uh, if you if by strip lighting you're talking about strip lighting LED strip lighting LED LED strip lighting well the one thing that works reasonably well is the color because you're not dealing with the same difficulties because you're not dealing with a white light LED a white light LED is a different animal than what's in an, in an RBG system an RBG but I'm not I'm not talking about RGB I'm talking about I have uh, cool white strip lighting oh you're talking I about also awesome. have warm white no this is the uh, the LED strips okay thank you okay. So I, just, I have a com I'm going to use a combination of both the warm and the white. And you're talking about uh, uh, dimming those, whatever you call those things you had in your hand. They have their own drivers. Where's the drivers in the LED, the strip? It's, there's either a box in there that's the driver or it's built into the strip itself. This, for example, has its own driver built in. Okay, this is part of it right here. These are, dimming, these are limiting resistors here. There's also a box that this thing is attached to mm -hmm. that's providing the correct current control for this. So it's a combination, but the uh, there is a there is a driver somewhere in that circuit. If it's got a it's got a tube, if it's got a little tube, the driver's actually on the back of that tube. It's it's surface mounted components on the back of the tube. Okay. But there has to even be the, you can't even, even the like cheap that. Chinese ones that I have up here have drivers on. They got resistors and a little circuit in each one yeah. of those strips. So yeah, they all have drivers. But back to what you said about dimming, isn't that due because LEDs run at three volts, essentially? I mean, some of them may run 2.5 or 2.2 or whatever. But right. in order to dim them, they're actually doing that pulse width modulation. They're turning them on and off at different rates yeah. so that the eye perceives dimness. They're not really right. dimming an LED. Yeah, they're turning it off. Well, actually, the funny thing is that that system that they're using is very similar to what's used in incandescent dimming. <laughs> It's, a, it's, a, it's basically a, 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 an SRC device that's actually creating um, it's creating a, what's called a sawtooth waveform. So it's actually pulsing on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off. And all you're doing is changing the width of that pulse in order to yes. determine how much it's on and how much it's off. You're doing exactly the same with the LEDs. The reason they do it, they do it with all LEDs, even if, even if they're not dimming them. Um, and part of the reason for that is to keep them cooler, because if they're not on all the time, they don't get as hot. Right? Yeah. yeah. But that's, Ralph, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure I completely answered your question. Well, uh, that's that's kind of why I had leaned toward using Arduino because because I'll grant you, I understand that while LEDs are the future of this, we're fairly early in the adoption curve, like you were saying for this. So I was leaning toward Arduino for and doing it myself, even though I'm expecting that to be kind of uh, labor intensive to figure out the code itself won't be hard, but finding the right values would be. If it were not for for wanting to get it so right and thinking I would have to do this manually, I would have laid toward the DMX12 protocol 
and built it with stage lighting systems like I've used it, I've used for stage systems before. But I was curious whether it, it with what you're saying and the, with the with the market not really caught up on that. DMX is likely not going to be solving the dimming problem at a level that I could do on the Arduino with PWM. Yeah, Andy, the dimming, the dimming, problem, the dimming problem is going to occur at the, uh, at the driver level. It's, it's the talking to the driver that's the problem. If, if you get your Arduino to do a 0 to 10 volt, for example, and if you want to dim, uh, get a driver that's a 0 to 10 volt driver, because you can buy the driver separate. Right. Um, so if you use a, you can't with this, obviously, because it's built in. But if you're using a separate system, you can. It's got a separate driver. You can you can get a driver that's zero to ten volt. You can get a driver that's not zero to ten volt, current limited or voltage limited. But the zero to ten volt is probably going to be easier to control than our Ralph, yeah. you have I would have preferred to use a commercial system like DMX or otherwise, just support ease of use, uh, not having to do this custom. But for right. somebody who wants a true day-to-night lighting effect, right now, today, I, yeah. I haven't found anything on the market, even though there's some fairly expensive, yeah. even model railroad specific layout lighting systems that are out there. But they're just, we're way too early in the curve. I, st- I think, it, from what yeah. I'm understanding, I think I'm still back to the fact that I'm pretty much going to have to do the hard work myself to get yeah. the effect. I'm, I'm a lighting designer, and I bought this because this is plug-and-play. So essentially, they have all the little adapters for the end, so you can make little yeah. joints, and you can make Ys, and, you know, you yeah. can do it. and they have the drivers, which you can run a 0-10 to volt driver, or you can run the driver that comes with a standard setup. If you get a separate 0-10 to volt, I've got 150 feet of this stuff, and, and it's, you know, it's run with a single, single driver and 0-10 to volt, three 0-10 to volt dimmers, Red, blue, green. And now all I need to do is my controller tells those dimmers what level to be at. Ralph, you still had a question. You were holding your LED strip up. Yeah, no, sorry, no, Ralph. it's okay. It's okay. I, I, my whole thing in, in model railroading, I am building a layout, but I do uh, weathering for people. Okay, cool. And I have cool white light under my uh, work, on top of my workbench here. Uh, I have cool white in the room. Right. And all LEDs, and I do my weathering here, and that cool white to me, and this is at, I think it's 5,000 K. Um, I take it outside, and and it works out beautiful for me. Yeah, you're you're closer to the high end, and, and that with outside is going to work fine. I mean, you're probably not going to use the model outside or display the model outside, but, you know, that's going to be – if you were using 3,000 inside, you're going to have a big difference when you take it outside. Right. And if you're using 6,000 inside or 5,000, it's going to be a lot less different when you take it outside. So, okay. Yeah, I can see that. Thing. Well, Jerry, that was a, this was a great show. I vastly enjoyed this. Of course, I kind of leaned toward the physics of it. So when you start fr- talking frequencies and, and temperatures and, and, and light spectrums, I, I'm all in. I, did, you I see his eye, did you see his eyes glaze over? Hey, you did that. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, I know. I could hear the snoring too, yeah. Yeah, no, I great. I greatly enjoy. If you get, I would, remember, I'm an IT guy. I'm a geek, man. So you get geeky. I, I'll go right there with you right down the rabbit hole. So Yeah, um, room full of lighting nerds. That's all you need. That's, that's it. Right? <laughs> we just had Light Fair. I didn't go this year. Uh, it was in Chicago this year. I didn't go. But uh, Light Fair is the annual North American uh, professional lighting industry event. 26,000 lighting geeks. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think it does go back to what I was saying before. If you understand Kelvin, if you've done photography, and any of us who deal even with the digital cameras nowadays, you need to get an, a concept understanding of the Kelvin temperature and what it can do to your eye and to the perception, not only of the photograph, but the live perception of your railroad. So it's a good to know that things are changing and getting better in some ways. It's yeah. good to know that there's a base level that, that really doesn't change and we can learn something and it doesn't just fly out the window and oh, what I learned that for, uh, so, you know, it's yeah. good. Yeah. It, it got, you got a little geeky, which is fine. I don't mind. I, I think it's kind of interesting to hear, what's going on, but it's nice to know that if somebody learns the Kelvin temperatures and learns what they do to your perception of color, that that still holds true today. Yeah. Don't be afraid to experiment. I mean, try, try out different things and uh, you know, you know, you may have to spend a few bucks to get a few fixtures and see what you really like and what you don't really like. 
But, at, you know, I'm always concerned about people running out and buying, you know, I hear these LEDs are great and they run out and spend 200 bucks and come back and go, I'm really not happy with this, you know. Um, so, you know, do, do some, do your research, do a little bit of experimenting, find out, the, you know, what's, what's just like if you were taking on a new paint, if you're starting using pan pastels for the first time or something like that, you're not going to go out and spend a thousand bucks and, you know, and then find out it doesn't really work for you, you know. So, you know, try, try a little bit first, uh, try the colors, um, try to try little accent light. And uh, I think, I think you can, you can do some, I'm seeing buildings in the background there, Miles, a little accent light on them. Beautiful. Yeah. Listen, I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. I know you're busy and you got several projects on your plate right now, but you're wonderful to have come and shared, you know, your knowledge and your expertise with us so that we can do a little bit better with our railroads. We'll have to, next time you're up uh, this way in, in uh, God's country, we'll have to get you to uh, come up and uh, see the new shop because uh, cool. of course, Mount Albert is now relocated to the new location and it's, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty spiffy shop. They may I not think. let him cross the border now, Jerry, because of all. <laughs> yes, uh, okay, he's got the tattoo. We'll let him in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, our, if our buddy in, in charge doesn't do it, now never. <laughs> we'll hope for the best. Right, yeah, right. you have to guarantee that you're going to go back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, thanks, Jerry. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, and we, I know we run a little long on everybody. We're knocking on two hours, but Johnny, if you want to go ahead and close this one up, station identification stuff, and we'll uh, uh, we'll call this a night. Thanks everybody for watching and follow participating up. in the chat. It's been pretty lively over there tonight. If there's any follow up questions, just email them to me or whatever, and I'll do my best to answer. Them. Great. Good. Good night, guys. Take care. Right. Thank you. Bye bye now. All righty. Uh, go to youtubemallbuilders.com. There you can check the schedules for the shows. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday shows are uh, uh, 8 o'clock Central, 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Thursday shows at 9 o'clock Central, 10 o'clock Eastern Time. Next week, June the uh, 19th, is going to be Big Bill's. Uh, who is Big Bill talking to? With uh, Ron Perry. And Joe Desmond's show, which is normally on Wednesday, which would be the next night, is going to be on the 21st, uh, on th next Thursday night, and it will air at 8 o'clock Central, 9 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, we had to do a little rescheduling for Joe because of a family event, which was fine. So next week, there will not be a Johnny Small Train talk show. I'm going to take a night off for a change. <laughs> Joe's taking my night, so I'm going to let him have it. Uh, so, with that said, I want to say thank you again to uh, Jerry for uh, coming in tonight. Very interesting show. So, we shall see you, uh, let's see, you next uh, Tuesday night for who is Big Bill talking to. Y'all have a good weekend, and see you Tuesday. <laughs>